do you have a favorite descriptive word like one that you just keep coming back to and you'll almost go out of your way to find a way to incorporate it into your writing jeff do you have one i don't think i do if i'm honest before we started part one of this conversation for the other episode i actually asked a couple of my frequent players if I have any descriptive words that I overuse or use a lot, and none of us could come up with any. Um, That's a good I, place to be. I really don't think I have any words that are either, if you look at it negatively or positively, are either a crutch or a word that I just like to use a lot. I really don't. I don't think I do. Adam? Um, there is a word um, that has popped up in an old song. I'm trying to remember what the song is. Uh, and the, the word is a descriptive word that, as far as I know, doesn't mean anything and they made it up and uh the word is revidescent so the, the i've had revidescent moments there have been items that have glown with a uh, revidescent quality <laughs> there have been npcs with a revidescent um attitude about them and i say it and i look so official and i move on so quickly that i've used this word as often as possible and my players have never questioned me on it but it always means whatever the context needs it to mean so uh, I, I really quite enjoy using revidescent. That, that makes me think of the Smurfs. Uh, I think it's from Tangerine by Moist, if I if okay. I remember correctly. Oh man, there was a made up word in one of the campaigns I got to play in a few years ago and I don't, I can't remember what it is. And I can't, I don't know where the notebook is that I had it written down. It was like a portmanteau of some sort that we came up with in the course of the campaign and it got used all the time as like an inside joke. But if I remembered what it was, you would know exactly what it meant. And I can't remember it. Kyle, do you have a word? Keep us guessing. Uh, I have several words. I really like the word truculent. <laughs> it's a good word. Yeah, it's it's a good word. And it kind of describes. That's when you're being like a truck, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling awfully F-150 today. Yeah. <laughs> It's a Mimic, the roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation on Dungeon Master Tips. I'm Adam, and with me today are Kyle and Jeff, and this episode is called Subtle Descriptions, Setting the Forest from the Trees. Uh, we've previously covered a lot of in our conversation on dungeon mastering, including world building, condition effects, some of the variant rules, and managing the game both in world and from a meta perspective. Last time we discussed this topic, we went over how dungeon masters can focus on the different senses to add verisimilitude and authenticity to their descriptions when they're explaining something new to the players. You can find over 30 episodes covering DM tips, tricks, and inspirations on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and dozens of other podcast apps, or you can jump over to the YouTube page and dig into the entire playlist on Dungeon Master tips that we've built there. In this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, this panel of Dungeon Masters is going to return to the topic of description and how to create deeper experiences and immersion with your players. Because there are more than five senses, more than one kind of adventure, and lots of subtle, nearly sociopathic ways to manipulate the players at your table. So before we get started, though, I want to talk about something that happened this past week in uh, in one of our games. Um, and Kyle, that was a game that you were a part of, right? Yep. Um, and what happened was, correct me if I'm wrong in any of these details, uh, what happened was uh, the Dungeon Master was um, uh, picked you guys up kind of where you left off uh, and surrounded by Bullywugs. And he described in the previous week that it was this big open like market square of Bullywugs, but he didn't really get into any major details about which um, like kind, kind of the nature of the Bullywugs or any specific descriptions of them. Through a whole bunch of D&D tomfoolery, you ended up disguised as a Bullywug and being their leader and then discovering that they were going to betray you. And so you gathered them all together and fireballed them. That's pretty standard D&D nonsense, right? Yeah, so, I would say so. Yeah. So the problem uh, arose after the fact when um, the DM then told you that was all of the bullywugs, including all the women and children in the tribe. You've committed genocide. The whole thing is done. <laughs> At which point you said, whoa, 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 that's not what I thought. I didn't do that on purpose. And that launched a three-day debate in our It's a Mimic Discord server 
about what is genocide and the nature of intent and on and on and on from there, which we're not going to get into in this episode. The learning point that I would like to, uh, to take from this discussion is the fact that the DM provided different information, did not describe it the, to its fullest, and therefore you acted in ways that you wouldn't have had you had all of the information. How did that make it, you feel to go through that journey? Uh, yeah, it's a little frustrating happening after the fact when you get when it feels like you only get half the information on the scenario uh, and you make kind of a gut reaction because you're trying to play it where you're in the moment. And so, yeah, I don't know. It, it's frustrating. It's a direct callback to what I mentioned on part one of this episode, where if you as the DM do not adequately describe the scene in your head, no one knows what that scene looks like except you. You know what the scene looks like in your head, but you have to translate it to the player. And not doing that can hurt both sides of the screen, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And depending on the table, depending on the relationship between the players uh, and the dungeon master, and depending on the medium even, this can destroy trust. Um, and that's going to mean that immersion is more difficult and a player, especially a new player, is going to be um, playing from the back foot, so to speak, like not uh, not coming at it fully engaged because there'll, there'll be a level of defensiveness up. I'm not saying that's you, Kyle, but I think that a lot of um, inexperienced D&D players will have this soured. The, every once in a while, okay, so I, I creep around, I lurk on all of the D&D uh, &D subreddits. And I'm going to say about once every four days or so, I see a post about, that's it, I'm done with d and I've been pissed off for the final time. And it's always down to DM, you know, shenanigans. It's very rarely a player having a problem with another player. And a lot of the time, it is a DM making a call or specifically making a call at the table that the player doesn't agree with and that don't understand, which is why communication is so important. When we sit down to record episodes, we tend to focus on one different aspect of communication for DMs. Um, one thing to really think about, to be clear about, and we've said over and over, talk to, talk to your DM, be clear. This is a collaborative storytelling experience, not um, an opportunity to have adversarial DMing or to get gotcha moments on your players. So with that in mind, when we are describing the introduction to an idea, a setting, a people, um, it ends up being far more important than I think we initially realize to set the stage so that everybody knows what's going on. A lot of the time people talk about my players are bored at the table or I just can't stay invested or everybody's looking at their phones and it's because they're not engaged. And maybe, and I'm not saying this is every table, but maybe some of the time they're not engaged because they don't have the information necessary to become engaged. There's something in D&D for everybody. It's not up to the players necessarily to do all of the legwork to be engaged. The DM is there, and I'm not putting this entirely on DM's shoulders, but the DM is there to give them the tools necessary for them to find the fun themselves in this, this little sandboxy game that we have here. Um, do you guys agree with that or am I? Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So I want to talk again. We spoke the majority of the last episode on this um, about the five senses, about what it was like to um, operate in um, darkness and light, whether you're heavily obscured or lightly obscured. We talked about uh, smell and how sometimes sound and smell are more effective and more important than even sight. Um, but there are a lot of different kinds of senses that we have beyond the basic five that were taught in you know, elementary school. So let's jump into some of the other senses that we as humans feel. Um, there are a couple of other weird uh, senses like echolocation and things. Uh, that exist out there that we can talk about in another episode. We're going to talk specifically about what humans, um, because that's kind of our baseline discussion for understanding uh, perception, um, what uh, what we experience. So besides just um, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, we also have things like temperature, being able to feel both hot and cold. Now, we're bringing all this stuff up because it's important um, when you are describing an introduction to a room or an object to think about these things as well. When they step into the room, is the room a different temperature from the area they were just in? 
coming in out of the cold uh, in, in an Arctic uh, scenario into a warm cabin is something that we obviously talk about, but feeling the cold um, blade, uh, the cold steel blade of a sword against your skin or something can be pretty evocative as well. And a, a lot of times people ignore the hot and the cold side of, uh, of this discussion. Another big one is pain. And there are lots of different kinds of sensations that trigger different reactions in the human uh, experience, um, but it all kind of lines up in the idea of pain. I went down a rabbit hole for like mm, three hours to figure out exactly what pain was and how it is classified by different uh, medical professionals. And I went through a lot of it. Some of these are senses and some of these are kind of just more awareness, um, but there is pain on your skin, pain in bones and joints and pain in organs and muscles. And that seems to be the three most um, common physical uh, types of pain that you know doctors in an emergency room are looking for. Um, so the skin, of course, is when you get cut bones or when you break a bone or fracture something um, or even like hit your funny bone or oh, man, I have bruised bones and in a lot of ways that it just, oh, it sucks. Uh, organs and muscles are a unique kind of pain when you when you've got like horrible, painful cramping in your intestines, that could be utterly debilitating. Oh, yeah. A headache or a migraine, holy shit, in ways that a, a cut or a burn don't affect you, right? Um, then there's uh, the kind of pain that is an itch. Itchy pain is uh, some of the most frustrating uh, and there is no break from it. I currently have a player in my, it's Dave, uh, in my campaign right now who is regrowing a limb. And I keep, every time it's his turn to say or do anything, anytime I talk to him, I remind him, there's an itch. You are itchy. Your, your stump is, <laughs> it is unbearably itchy to the point where he has one level of exhaustion because he's always focused on his disadvantage on, on things. So there's hunger hunger pangs um, and dehydration as well. And then we get into uh, things like vomiting reflex. You have a sense of whether or not you are drugged or poisoned. If you have a character that has been poisoned and is suffering the poisoned condition and you are not describing that to them, all you are doing is giving them a condition effect that they're going to shrug off on the next save. So really think about how to describe these things. And my, my answer is always to sit down ahead of time and write out what it feels like about three or four different ways so that I have the language in front of me to describe it in the heat of the moment. Um, and then there are other kinds of general distresses like mental distress, uh, spiritual distress, emotional distress, and mood. These are things that you can become aware of in yourself, like your heart starts pounding faster uh, because your adrenaline's up. Um, the idea that uh, you suddenly feel very uh, alone or like everybody's looking at you and you feel vulnerable. These are still feelings. These are still things that we are sensing. And these are things that you can tell players, this is the feeling that you have. But remember, we don't tell them how to have emotions or what emotions they're feeling. You can say you can feel the rage starting to build inside you, but they are still in control. It's still their agency, but whether or not they want to squash that or go into a barbarian frenzy, right? So that's kind of walking a bit of a, a fine line there. When it comes to things like spiritual distress, think about what that would be like for a cleric uh, or a druid to be stepping into um, desecrated areas for evil false gods. How does that make their skin crawl and the hair stand up on the back of their neck? These are different ways to think about um, describing an area outside of just what you see or smell or, or hear. Now, there are a lot more. There's a sense of balance, um, which got broken down into not just do you know if you're upright or not, but, you know, we can all sense gravity, right? We can all sense, and, and you know that based on the G-forces when you take off in an airplane, right? Yeah. Um, there's air and wind pressure we can uh, feel with. When was the last time you had a DM say uh, you step into the open cavern and your ears pop? right? We don't think Never. about that, right? So, um, and then the idea of motion. And every time that I put players on a ship in choppy waters, I always have them roll a con save to see who vomits. Um, and that's it. That's purely for flavor, but it's something that they remember. 
Um, then there's what's called a uh, proprioception, which is the perception of body awareness. If you close your eyes and you hold your hand out, you go to poke yourself in the nose. You don't poke yourself in the eye or the ear or the belly button because you have this awareness with your own body um, about where you are uh, in relation to yourself. This is something that I'm not sure is always going to come up or come up even at all during a campaign necessarily, unless you're dealing a lot with darkness. Um, the idea of being um, like magically bound in darkness was the one that I came up with, where there's a, something that's keeping you from moving your limbs. You, you're trying to strain to feel it, but, but you're not able to. Um, there are pheromones that we are all very subtly aware of. Um, I usually think about pheromones when it comes to one of two things, plants or lust. Uh, a lot of the incubus succubus shit is pheromone based for me and so some of the time when i have them do a save it's a con save to shake off the pheromones not just one of the mental stats um there's the idea of companionship you can sense when you are with somebody and it's always weird when you think you can sense them and you turn around and they're not there like when you're walking with a group you know through a crowded mall or something and you're talking to them and you turn around and they're three stores behind staring at a window right yeah and then that can also work for, uh, you know, having the sense of people watching, you, right? Yeah, it's one of the things that I really like to do with my passive perception um, during a, a overnight watch, right? Because I always have my players take watch and shifts. And a lot of the time, well, when they roll high enough that they perceive something, they just are aware that there are eyes on them, or they can feel the hair on the back of their neck start to stand up, or they get a chill that says, wait a minute, I'm not alone. And that can be far more frightening than you hear a twig snap in the darkness. Yeah. We can also very loosely sense um, electricity and magnetism. That's not something necessarily that every player is going to really dig into. But if I had an Aarakocra, I would let them absolutely sense when there's, uh, there's um, magnets uh, somewhere around. I know this is a bit of a weird one, but I'm thinking like evil temples of... Uh, made of wrought iron and shit like that. And the air coker just knows where the center is because a lot of birds have that ability uh, like located high in the beak. They've got a, uh, I'm not even sure what it is. They've got some sort of receptor that lets them feel magnetism. Little things like that that's going to make your characters feel more connected um, to the players instead of just having it be, yeah, you guys are walking around and are you going to go left or right? You can turn to the air coker and say, because of your bird nature you know that you are still going north you can also use electricity a little bit if you're looking for a way to forewarn someone of dangers ahead in the sense that if you are planning to put your players in front of something that has lightning attacks of some sort you may be able to feel a static charge building as you approach and you can use that as a dm to give a little bit of a warning depending on perception or something that you can feel your hair stand up. You can you can see your friend's hair sticking out, as can happen if you're about to get hit by lightning on top of a mountain or something. These are also things you can use to describe danger coming of a specific sort. Yeah. Um, another one is time. We can always perceive the passage of time, uh, although we're often not good at it as humans. Um, sometimes something like a divination wizard um might be uh if there are specific divination uh, or diviners in the group they might have a better uh idea uh what was the the chronomancy the chronergy pretty... yeah. yeah um whatever. and then there's the the keen mind feat as well gives pretty good concept of time yeah but i mean i see i do this every time they enter an extra dimensional space or have a vision or communicate with a god they lose all sense of time and they have no idea how long it's been, right? And sometimes it'll be hours and sometimes the whole conversation took place in the half a second, right? And it gives me the opportunity to just show a little bit of the immense power and the, the uh, unnatural, supernatural weirdness of the circumstances as well. There's a really good example of that in the fourth and final episode of the recent, and it'll be a little older by the time this comes out, uh, Critical Role, Exandria Unlimited Calamity series. Uh, Brennan, the DM, manipulates the perception of time expertly in that last 
episode, particularly in the first hour. All right, I might check that out. I don't usually listen to uh, to Critical Role, but um, I'm always interested in weird, wobbly time shit. So um, when it comes to D&D, we also get two other things that I sat down and I really thought about. What makes us feel different and heroic and fantastical? And one of them is our connection to magic and the weave or a connection to a god. This is something that people um, that are characters in D&D will actually feel. If suddenly they can't, if they walk into an anti-magic zone, what does that feel like? If they suddenly lose the connection to the god that has been with them watching over their shoulder for the last 17 sessions, what is that like? How do they feel that? And how can you describe that feeling to them? Some to think about because these are the moments that are going to make them feel different and special. And that kind of led me into the last one that I have here, which is the idea of permeating evil. We hear about this a lot in fantasy um, and horror, where you can just feel the darkness coming from the that house on the end of the street. But we don't really get much descriptive language about it besides the hair on your arms stick up. There's a sinking feeling in your stomach, an overwhelming sense of dread, whatever that means, right? Like there are these descriptors, but it's worth thinking about when they go to fight the god of death, what does that feel like in the air around them? Is, is that an emotionally or physically charged experience? So, guys, I have a couple of questions. So let's grab our dice and roll. 15. Lucky number seven. I got a two. So, Jeff, you are first. First of all, how often do you use these other, like, warning kind of senses in your D&D games? Not nearly as often as I would like. Um, I am strongly considering taking this list and just posting it up at my desk where I play D&D, um, just as a visual reminder to occasionally throw some of the stuff in when it makes sense. It can get easy sometimes to get wrapped up in more simple or concrete details of a scene and lose sight of this because I'm focused on pushing into the next and the next and the next thing. Um, yeah, there's definitely some of this that I'm, I'm planning to try to remember more in the future. Uh, I'm going to drop this note in the show notes as well, um, this list, if anybody wants to take a look at that. Um, Kyle? Uh, I'd say fairly often. Um, it's generally a pretty quick thing, and it's normally done as like a consolation prize. So, so like, say someone just fails a perception check, I think it's a, I won't give them a huge amount of information to go on, but I'll be like, you know what? Here, have this. To this is give you a clue. like the consolation prize of you don't see the guys skulking in the shadows, but you can feel the eyes watching you. Yeah, exactly. Um, I have to say that I don't use this nearly as much as I want to outside of a horror setting. The moment I get into a horror setting, uh, I lean on a lot of this stuff pretty hard uh, because I want those kind of intangible and weird descriptions. But the moment I'm in high fantasy or action adventure or something, I'm not describing so much the the feeling of an area or the um, the air pressure in here. That like it just it's dank and dark and cold in the cave, right? And that and then I stop and I move on to the next thing because everybody knows what a cave is like. And I don't like this is one of my failings as a DM is I don't spend enough time really describing not not what you. Um, sense or perceive what you experience in a location and again this can also all apply to um to peoples and items uh as well and even some actions uh when somebody wields a specific dagger that is that that is where the evil is coming from right or you're sitting there having a conversation with the uh an ifrit you have to know that that is just like you can feel the heat on your face every time he speaks right like there's definitely things we can think about like that um are we comfortable having these conversations uh with these fantastical creatures that exist out there um when you are sitting there i, I love the idea this is occurring to me now um when you are talking to a beholder you should always feel like there are many, many, many people looking at you. Not just one person having a conversation, but like there's a crowd of people surrounding you. You are being watched from all sides all of the time. That's got to be weird and creepy. You make your skin crawl. 
which if I remember correctly, I think directly calls into the layer actions for a beholder as well. Yeah. So I, it's something that I need to think more about myself. Um, again, when I'm in a horror setting, <clears throat> that just comes because horror is my natural state of being. <laughs> um, Jeff, how often do you single out specific characters? Often. Um, I find that most of the time player groups tend to stratify a little bit with your high wisdom characters and your low wisdom characters that are more insightful or perceptive. Um, and those player characters e at each extreme tend to get singled out the most. Either the one that is kind of oblivious to everything or the one that's super keyed into the one guy looking at them from three blocks away. Um, if you're going to invest character resources into your senses or you're going to completely dump a sense, those decisions I try to reward. And even if you, like, if you, it's easy to want to say, punish a dump sense. No, I'm rewarding your choice to have a very low wisdom character because it is a character choice. This is the type of person I want to play. I'm going to reward that in a slightly different way than I will the person who took the observant feat, has a passive perception of 21. Um, just like I would reward anybody that goes hard at stealth or picking up the best armor they can find. Um, this is the kind of thing I do specifically to key into the choices your players make when they build their character. And by reward, you don't mean like, hey, you built a stupid character, here's gold. You mean you built a right. stupid character, here's that experience, I'm going to acknowledge this. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Kyle? Uh, I try to do it as much as I can, right? Uh, everybody wants to feel engaged and everybody wants to feel important, right? Like they're adding something to the game that nobody else brings. So yeah, I, tr I try to do it as much as I possibly can. Um, yeah, I do as well. Um, the big thing that I try to do is also be inclusive as I single out specific characters for senses. And um, that sounds a little bit strange, but let's say I have a bunch of people that are rolling a perception check because that's the easiest one for everyone to get the brain around. Um, and three of the players fail, one of them barely makes it, and one of them gets well over, you know, 10 plus beyond what they needed. Um, I will tell the other, the three that failed, uh, what are you guys doing? Okay, so you are clearly distracted by these things, and you don't pick up on anything except the basic thing that triggered the perception check in the first place. Then the person that barely made the check gets the basic level of information. Um, you see the troll. Right. But the person with the 20 suddenly gets all of this extra descriptive language, this this flowery language. As you said last uh, episode, we talked about this, Kyle, um, the uh, the idea that you can smell it and there's the sound of its like postules dripping and oozing onto the stone floor. And like I will paint that picture. Not only does it reward this one character, but every player at the table is now engaged even though their characters aren't. And that's something else to think about when you're uh, when you're using descriptive language. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to do that, not just, I used to pass notes. If you got the highest perception, here's what you get. Do you tell everyone else? But it made it always feel like I was excluding some, like the rest of the party, so. Something else I just thought of too, when it comes to singling out specific characters. Um, if you're going to offer tailored wording tailored descriptions for the easy choice again is perception how uh, how someone notices something think about that player that notices it and what class they're playing and what it means if a wizard finds an unseen person in the forest or a ranger finds an unseen person in the forest or a rogue because a ranger might be keyed into the smells. They may be keyed into a few broken sticks through the bush that nobody else noticed. Whereas a wizard may just get a tingle on the back of their neck and a rogue is actively seeking every shadow they pass. So tailoring your description to specific characters experience, what class they play, what background they have in how they discover, how they encounter certain things that can also, again, reward player build, uh, character building choices. This is the character I built and kind of feed the description to the, deci the decisions that they've made as a player. You can also do that with the playable races too. Like uh, the Tabaxi's yep. whiskers twitch at the, at the change in the uh, 
temperature or the the way the air is moving um or the way that uh, a loxodon and a minotaur are going to react differently than a halfling or an elf right right, like, right we have so many different things now a fairy is probably tuned in a whole lot uh, more differently than the sound that a heron gone hears so um being hyper aware of of these characters and how they perceive the world something to think about the next time you're going on a long drive you're stuck in traffic right just just mull it over you're, you're doing yourself a, a a solid if you stop and think about it um do you guys make them roll checks or saves if they feel these uh these different kind of warning senses as i call them uh what, what do you mean by that um if it's suddenly getting uh hotter in here and you know that it's getting hotter um do you make them roll to see if they can sense the temperature change um do you make them roll to sense gravity or do you just give them that information because it's new and interesting and descriptive language i think it depends upon what my intent is with the scene mm -hmm. is it something that i think or i want them all to notice right away is it something I want there to be a chance that they don't notice it? Um, the, the, the specific situation and what's going on can influence whether or not I have them roll a check or a save or just give it to them. Um, whether that's something that I specifically want every, again, if I want everyone to be aware that there's an electrical charge right before you walk into a blue dragon's lair, or if I want there to be a chance that they don't pick up on an electric charge because of a particularly well hidden monster that also has some kind of lightning attack, I might do two completely different things in those scenarios. Yeah, and frankly, that's when passive perception comes into play as well. Yep. Right. Um, so I guess I guess the real question is: Do you rely? Will you allow them to have passive perception to um, understand the literal um, gravity in a situation? Uh, motion, pheromones, um, the passage of time. Does passive perception cover these things for you? Kyle, do you have any opinions or thoughts? Mm, I think it would have to depend on how important it is and how dangerous that information is, right? Like if it is, could actively result in them being in danger, I think I would use passive perception, uh, but if it's mostly just for setting a scene, no i wouldn't bother with it because i feel I, I think it changes what that information can mean yeah it's pretty specific to me um i agree with you guys do they do they need this information is and is it um absolutely pertinent and i kind of think as well like a lot of the times that there's an air pressure difference in a room because a door opens or I live up a mountain. When I drive down the mountain, sometimes my ears pop, sometimes it doesn't. But you know what? I Maybe it pops every time and I don't pay attention to it because it's a freaking DC4 check. My passive perception hits it every time and I just don't acknowledge it, right? There, so. there are a lot of times when I'll have my players roll a check with a very low DC just to look to see if they make a horrible, horrible failure. There are times where I'll set a DC four or five check and just basically I'll tell my players, I'm going to have you roll. I really just want to see if you roll a one or a two. It's funny. I, I, my players are used to hearing this from me. All right. Uh, everybody give me a perception check. Don't fail. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, and that just means don't roll a, like, don't roll a five or under. Right. It's not right. even don't roll a one because it's not an automatic failure on a check or a save. Right. Right. So, right. Um, uh it, so the last thing i want to talk about is this idea of the the permeating sense of evil or this connection to the weave or this kind of thing that is there's a, a base set of uh of kind of magical awareness this base sense that uh most characters would have especially if they're dialed into that kind of, of uh side of a D, D world right so when things start to present differently, like there is this overwhelming sense of evil as you descend into the cave, or suddenly there's this uh, anti-magic field where you know that you are not connected to the weave anymore, and you can feel it when you're in this anti-magic zone, um, there's usually a reason for that to be there. There's almost always a source of it right the more obvious the source is usually the more potent or powerful it is for example if it's a small black gem in the dungeon that's giving off these evil vibes it's probably got a radius of like 30 feet but if it is a freaking 400 foot uh monolith 
that just appeared in the jungle. You can probably feel that for miles. Do you subvert this stereotype? Do you lean into the idea of the bigger the thing is, the more powerful it is, um, the more intense it, uh, the feeling, the more uh, or the easier it is to discover the source of this? This is not something I have honestly thought about in play. Um, it might just be one of those things I go by gut and don't consciously realize I'm playing with this or not. Um, it's something I'll certainly be thinking about going forward, particularly with where my players are in Barovia right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> They're in the Amber Temple. There's a lot of really bad shit in there. Um, um, yeah, it's not It's not something that I've consciously keyed into much. Kyle, how do you feel about this? Uh, I mean, I don't think bigger always necessarily means stronger. I mean, it's magic. Size doesn't always correlate, I guess. I really but thought I you were do... going to say size doesn't matter. I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do really like the idea of um, describing the law. So I, I keep coming back to the idea of, let's say you have a cleric uh, who steps into this anti-magic field. And I imagine like maybe if it was a cleric of Pelor or any type of sun god, they might feel their connection to the weave as like sunlight on their back right like they always have this warm spot right on their neck like it's the sun shining on them and then they step into this anti-magic field and then that goes away right and then that's how you can describe their loss of magic and their connection to it and then maybe the closer they get to the source that the colder that spot becomes yeah i see i like that and so it's a proximity thing as well right not just a size but a proximity thing uh, every time that I send my players into the Feywild, I have all their senses go weird. Uh, things that are far away sound louder than they actually are. Uh, fires burn hotter. It's a small candle that'll warm an entire large hall. Um, just, I want them to feel things differently so that when they go to the Shadowfell, it's the opposite. That roaring bonfire gives you no heat, right? And so I do mess with these concepts of these warning senses especially when it comes to the idea of evil, um, because I often like to play in the, the mirror realms, the Feywild and the Shadowfell. So when you end up in the Feywild, um, something that gives off just a little, a little aura of evil, everyone can suddenly feel that. This is out of place and it does not belong here. And it would be the same if you were to take it to one of the upper planes. You take this to Elysium, for example, that's Everybody in a 10 mile radius knows you brought evil here and they're coming for you, right? Um, whereas uh, if you were to take it into the Shadowfell uh, or like Barovia, any of the, the Ravenloft settings, um, or you go into one of the lower planes, um, you can take evil in and they won't notice, but they will notice when you take something good in there, right? Um, on the plane of fire, do you feel fire more intensely or is it just more status quo? Do you feel air currents more intensely in the plane of air? Do you feel um, pressure like um, uh, and tension more in the, uh, in the plane of water? Just things to think about when you're going to these weird different areas um, in D&D that we don't ever get to experience in real life. I think about this all of the time because I, I play against big evil um, in my campaign and I want my players to know that they can sense the evil bad guys there so that when all of a sudden they can't, but they know he's evil, then there's something seriously wrong with this guy because they're not getting any bad vibes off him, but there's something really wrong with him and they already know it from context. That means that this guy's going to stand out to them. Hi, this is going to be a little bit different from our regular commercial breaks, but I just wanted to mention something that we probably should have said earlier in this episode, and that is that when you are discussing things like pain, discomfort, distress, uh, permeating sense of evil, the idea of being alone or having trouble determining reality or time, you should really cover some of these ideas in your session zero ahead of time. And if it's popping up later in a campaign, uh, there's no harm in having a session 0.5 partway through a campaign or sitting down and talking to people a session or two ahead of time when you know this is on the horizon and coming. Hey, I'd like to explore these themes. Is everyone okay with that? You can hit me up uh, in private messages 
uh, after this session. Uh, I just wanted to get it clear before I do my prep for the future sessions. It's okay to have these conversations and we need to keep our players' level of comfort in mind. As much as we want to make our fictional characters feel fictional pain so that we can have real catharsis for our real people, we do not want to create real discomfort for the players around the table. So please keep that in mind when you are DMing and you are going through some of these warning senses. It's a whole lot different than you smell something bad when you start talking about the idea that, hey, you are overcome with the idea of being uh, drugged or poisoned by this flower. You don't know if a, that person has ever been roofied in the past or drugged at a party. Like, you don't know. Double check and always err on the side of caution. All right, let's get back to the episode. So a lot of the time when we're dealing with descriptions and describing things, um, we're dealing with the idea of introducing new information, right? Um, a lot of the time, what we're looking at is giving the players something to hold on to. And you get this a lot when you're reading novels in particular, where a location or a person is described clearly the first time. And then it, we don't get those descriptions again later on. You get it the once, and then they may mention a couple of things like, oh, you know, the big banquet hall, but they don't get into the huge paragraphs, this, this massive wall of text describing the decorations in there or what's on the ceiling in the banquet hall, any of that shit. You get it once. We tend you've to do clearly, that. Sorry? Oh, uh, I was going to say, you've clearly never read The Wheel of Time. <laughs> There, there are some, there are some exceptions. Like uh, George R. R. Martin describing uh, how food is every fucking time. The quality <laughs> and nature of food, Jesus. So, but for the most part, when we're doing D and D, we do it on the original introduction or when something transitions. Now, what I mean by that is uh, when you go from, you know. Uh, outside in the forest to suddenly going into a cave we will talk about light we're going to talk about sound we're going to talk about how uh the size of the space that you're in because it's a new space it's a new thing that you are perceiving and just leaving one space and entering another that transition forces a bit of a descriptor but you have to think about what some of the other transitions are every time they loot a body and find an object that's a transition they went from not having a thing to having a thing. What is the thing? It's worth describing. Every time that there is a new NPC that walks out, it's not just three elves. Describe the elves. And I'm not saying put four paragraphs onto each of them, but give them the idea of age, or maybe elves is the wrong, it's the wrong descriptor for age, but um, but describing age, height, build, um hair color even just something for them to latch on to so it's not just three faceless elves facial expressions is good too right like do they look angry do they look like they're gearing up for a fight do they look injured you know it adds a lot of context to a conversation as well also and affects how your players are going to react to it to add to that the group of six dwarves five of them look angry one of them doesn't why yeah, and I was going to say, this is how I, what you guys are saying is exactly where I was going to go next. <laughs> this is um, this is how I uh, like to push NPCs into the background. And this is what happened, I think, with these Bullywugs that you were up, uh, you were dealing with, Kyle, um, is they were all just giving, they're given faceless, nameless, Bullywug-shaped NPCs. So they faded into the background. There was nothing special uh, about them even though knowing that there were women and children and civilians in this, this group, that is noteworthy when we're dealing with a combatant uh, kind of scenario, right? Where the, suddenly these are non-combatants mixed in. That's important information. The DM decided it wasn't important enough to repeat. And then here we are with this whole mass murder, right? Instead of just war. Mm -hmm. It went from being a battle to a massacre, right? And that's not really fair to to the players when that kind of shit happens so um you have to look for these differences and these transitions um using npc reactions is a phenomenal way of bringing your players in because a lot of the times they're gonna say yeah 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 
Uh, it's another dwarf. Uh huh. It's another happy little fat halfling. Sure. But the halfling that spits on the floor when you walk in the room and narrows its eyes is suddenly going to get their attention because it's something a little out of the ordinary. They're not expecting that to happen. And it is the unexpected that tends to pull people's attention. So when we are using um, our description, when we're using all of our uh, skills to talk about the different senses and these warning senses we were talking about in the first part of this episode, um, we should be thinking about when we're using them and why. Now, there are really, I, I came up with a number of different uh, examples when I was going through this, but this episode would be eight hours long. So I tried to lump them generally into four groups um, of, of tones, of uh, themes, really, of emotional states, uh, where people are going to rely on these descriptors more so than uh, in your standard um, high fantasy or adventure. That stuff is important. It's always important to say, but it's really going to stand out in um, four unique scenarios. And it's when you're trying to describe horror, when you're trying to describe comedy, when you're trying to describe majesty or awe, or when you're trying to describe disgust. This is when people tend to really focus on the descriptor. And if you don't hit the description correctly, you're going to lose the effect. More so than just that elf over there is wearing gleaming shining armor, or there's a, a knight on a white steed, right? That's important, sure. But if you want the majesty of it, you've got to hit those big descriptive detailed words. This is where I start to script my descriptions ahead of time, right? So that I'm hitting these points and I'm not just kind of washing over them. So uh, let's grab our dice real quick, guys. I have a few more questions. God, I can't roll to save my life today. I got a three. Four. This is when I didn't want to roll a 19. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Well, Jeff, here you are. Um, <laughs> when it comes to these transitions, these large groups, like you said, um, there are five dwarves uh, that are just standing and looking at you. The sixth one has got some unique quality. So everyone's going to focus on that sixth one. Um, when do you feel the need to zoom in and zoom out uh, Zoom out when it comes to these descriptions? Like, at what point do you go very general? Oh, again, this is why I didn't want to roll a 19 on this. <laughs> these things, I feel, for me, are more nebulous and harder to describe how and when I do it versus just feeling when to do it. I don't know. Is it, I mean, is it based off your player's engagement? Player's engagement and or a need to draw their attention to something or a desire to just give them more general less distinct description uh kyle when do you zoom in or zoom out uh i mean i think it has a lot to do with player engagement um are these going to be nameless thug one nameless thug twos um or they are they actually important npcs i i try to give a little bit of a clue to the player being like Hey, maybe this person is someone you should talk to, right? Did they have um, a name before your players walked in the room? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think that's generally when. But player engagement has a lot to do to do with it too, right? Like, are they tuning out for my descriptions? Because if they are, what's the fucking point? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I like to zoom in and zoom out. Um, exactly what you guys are saying to, with. The idea of drawing their attention to something, um, that tends to be why we spend our time doing descriptive um, narrative at all, is so that people can understand the setting to the degree that they need to, right? We don't want to overwhelm people with description, except sometimes when I do. I'll circle back to that. Um, the idea that you say about thug one, thug two, but you know that um thug three is the big one with the scar over his eye that is that has a name and is going to be an issue like you spend a little time describing him differently even if you don't tell them right away what his name is right mm -hmm. um a great example of this in my head is always dire wolves because i never describe a dire wolf i never describe a dire wolf you know what a dire wolf is when it comes um out of the trees if there are four or five dire wolves there I will talk about how they're stalking the party. I talk about their actions, but I don't give them each descriptions. My players know what a dire wolf is. I don't need to waste my time. 
except when there's the alpha of the pact who is large and black and has a scar over his eye and like now suddenly this is the one that's bigger and scarier that they should focus on and i've just turned this dire wolf into a boss monster merely with my descripting uh, my descriptive uh language now sometimes i like to give too much language i zoom in too much and this is only when i'm doing riddles and puzzles if you need to find the three items in the room i will describe 40 fucking items <laughs> right like good luck figured out this is the puzzle i'm not going to say find the three items the bowl the cup and the spoon by the way there's a spoon on the desk a bowl on the shelf <laughs> right like I, i'm not going to give that i'm going to describe all of the shit in the room for you to figure out right i think of the last um puzzle at the end of indiana jones and last crusade if there had only been one cup on that fucking table that would have been a very short and completely tenseless um scene so i uh i think that it's sometimes worthy um to hit them with a little bit too much information when you want to obscure the facts a little bit mm -hmm. Uh, how often do you let rumors or NPC reactions or in-world descriptions inform your players of what's ahead? The potentially unreliable narrator in the game. Jeff? All the fucking time. All the time. Um, particularly, this is also, this is how you as a DM, particularly a less experienced DM, convey to your players that maybe you shouldn't go here yet. Uh, maybe this particular branching path, uh, branch of the path is for when you're level nine and not when you're level five. Yeah. Um, you mentioned to an NPC at the tavern, oh, tomorrow we're going to go up to Mount such and such. And just every head in the room turns and looks at you. And the one crusty old guy in the corner goes, well, it's your funeral. Uh, don't go up there. The ground yeah. is sour. Yeah. <laughs> start you know feeding rumors and information about how how dangerous and the fact that no one comes back like you can do this to attract your players to an area you can do this to try to get them to understand that maybe this isn't the time yet i do this stuff all the time to manipulate my players into doing what i want them to do without them thinking like that's what i'm doing uh, kyle how often do you rely on the this in-world uh, description uh, I mean, fairly often um, for a little bit of different reasons than Jeff. I mean, a, a lot of the time I do it just to remind players of what they're supposed to be doing, because some of them have memories like goldfish. <laughs> so you have to like constantly prod them like, hey, remember, this was a quest line. And so was this one. And so was this one. Um, or this is a secondary objective to the thing that you're currently trying to do. Don't forget about it. I uh, I sat down in my session zero, God, years ago with my players. And I said, so you know, the world is full of unreliable narrators, even the ones with the best meaning intentions. And just because an ally gives you the wrong information doesn't mean that he's an enemy and trying to fuck you over. He may just have the wrong information and in trying to be helpful. Right. And then early on in the campaign, I started to give them um, scenarios where they would then ask an NPC what they thought in front of another NPC, and the two NPCs would fight and give conflicting information, therefore setting the fucking tone. Coming out of the blue with the uh, inaccurate rumors or over the top reactions, especially for new players, is going to be just confusing and befuddling. But once I have set that tone, Fuck, I rely on that every interaction. Everyone says, well, wait a minute, what does that mean? I also love to use this shit um, because my description when I'm not in character is actually what's happening. It is an objective perspective on what, what's going on. This cave is dark, but a four-year-old child looking at the cave in the shadows, going, no, it's dark, right? Is suddenly unreliable and is being translated through fear like that's the interpretation we're getting so maybe it's not as dark as the kid thinks um what is scary and i tend to use um emotional responses from my npcs to try to uh, color the flavor of what's going on but i totally pulled the wool over their eyes in the last campaign where i told them they needed to go get a red i forget what it was it was a red orb a magic red orb and then everyone was talking about the crimson orb the crimson sphere and because 
the characters in world, the NPCs, were using different descriptive language than the DM. It had them running in circles for a couple extra sessions trying to find this thing that they had laid, laid eyes on twice before this moment, where they're like, oh, shit, yeah, this is the thing we're looking for, right? Just because the description wasn't consistent. You describe it as a red orb. They describe it to themselves as a crimson orb. And then when they finally see it, you go, yeah, there's a red ball over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Look, it can bounce. <laughs> <laughs> Smash. Oh. <laughs> um, Jeff, do you have a single tip, the most important thing you can think of off the top of your head for other DMs about setting a scene with a creepy vibe? Um, slow down. Yeah. Uh, slow down is one. Give them time to overanalyze everything you say. Um, if I tell you you're walking into, you know, a long, dark corridor and you can hear water dripping and you can smell whatever, like, slow down. Give them time to think about all the worst case scenarios in their head of what you're not describing. And as we've, you know, talked about now at length with, you know, one and a half episodes of this stuff, use their senses against them. Talk about what they can smell, what they can hear. Um, get all into it. The feeling of being watched. Use the senses to allow your players to write the creepiness in their own head and give them time to let it sink in. Kyle, do you have anything? Yeah, I think Jeff makes an excellent point. Hitting all five senses is important, I think. Um, it really allows them to have a complete kind of picture about what's going on. And the more, I don't want to say the more information you give them, but if you can give them more of the same information, if that makes sense, um, yeah. it really builds into a picture, a more complete picture. Um, I'd have to say that one of the things that I really thought about hard, um, I started running Curse of Strahd about a year ago, 10 months ago, um, and right at the beginning of it, and kind of the inspiration for where this episode came from, uh, is a little DM tip in the book that tells you to use personification for your surroundings. The house doesn't just loom over you. It, it's almost like it's watching you. It's looking at you, right? There are the, the light is not flickering, it's dancing, right? The more that you use this personification of items uh, or objects or uh, scenery, acting like it has a will of its own can really set people um, on edge. And it's something that I've gotten to play with quite a bit to the point where uh, my player, because I was running a, a one player version of curse of strahd um she tried to bail out of death house uh, more than once though the run out of the room and head to the front door and have to have her sidekick say are you sure that we should be leaving those kids still need our help inside <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> um, never mind the fact the uh what she finds when she gets to the door yeah but she never figured it out. She never actually opened the front door. She got to it right. and turned around to make sure the NPCs were coming, and they never were. They're like, we still have a job to do. Because that level of, she felt that house and the presence of that house weighing down upon her because of the way that the house was oppressively uh, acting and moving and feeling around her, not just what it looked like or smelled like, but these descriptive action words to really ramp up the horror. Uh, what's one tip that you have, Jeff, for DMs who want to set a scene with a comedic feeling? Comedy is the hardest thing to do, right? Like this is the- It really is. Um, I'm not a great DM for this. I'm much more the DM that understands that my players are going to bring comedy whether I want them to or not. <laughs> That's fair players enough. Players use comedy as a coping mechanism for all the dread and horror that I bring to the table. So honestly, I'm not a good person to give this tip because for the most part, comedy in my campaigns is spontaneous um, and it is usually incited by the players trying to break tension because well, they're getting anxious about something I'm putting them through. Well, let me, let me circle back to you then about this because you might be the perfect person to ask this to. Uh, because you don't have a huge wealth of information and a huge history in running comedic uh, settings or scenes. When it does happen, is there a consistency, a consistent thing or theme that you run into? What's the one thing, if you have, if you know you have to elicit a response out of them, you know you have to make them laugh, 
what's the one thing you rely on? Oh, we'll circle back and hit you at the end. Kyle, do you have any uh, uh insight Don't about- try too hard. Don't try too hard? Yeah, don't try too hard. Uh, a comedic name goes a long way. Players love a good pun in a name. Intentionally uh, or not. Yeah, yeah, intentionally or not. Like, that's it's a good way to reach them. Um, and yeah, other than that, just don't try too hard. Let it come naturally. Like, get uh, one thing that you think is funny and then allow it to become a collaborative effort, right? Don't try to pigeonhole yourself or overscript something. Yeah, that was going to be mine as well, is to sit down and listen. I think that's pretty much what Jeff said as well, is the players are going to look for the, that comedy all of the time, um, and they're going to latch on to the shit that you don't want them to anyway. So if you want them to be laughing and, and dicking about, let them listen to, observe them and what they find is funny, so that you can build on that. Because if you come at them with a great big over the top pun that you've been building for three sessions and it falls flat, uh, that's potentially one of the worst feelings as a DM. Uh, speaking from experience, I set my players up to fight actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf, and they did it for an entire session and didn't realize who they were fighting. And I spent the entire session building that it was a pain in my ass. I am not that DM. <laughs> still, still nothing. No, I'm just saying like the long burn comedy planned out laugh is not me. I'm yeah, much more it, the off the cuff. Um, I would just say maybe if I wanted to throw one thing out there, I would say provide and latch on to one absurd detail that doesn't match anything else and let them grab it the goliath named tiny or just you know you know or you have a goliath with that's a tough looking guy with a tough looking name but he has one one long hair sticking out of his ear. one little tiny absurd detail can be enough to get an otherwise serious situation into your players goofing about it and having a good time um, do you have a tip about how people should set the scene for uh, majestic beauty? I'm going to go back to the first thing that I said when we rolled dice and say, this is not when I wanted to roll a 19. <laughs> yeah. Because again, I go like a lot of this stuff is just off the cuff for me. I don't think about it consciously. So I don't know how to necessarily describe um, how I handle it because it's just things that when they happen, they happen. And I don't think about it ahead of time that much. Um I don't know, like this, if I wanted to portray this, this is probably something I would try to script, but I don't necessarily know how to tell you how I would do that. Kyle, do you have any uh, any insights? Uh, I think the best way to um, kind of show it is light interaction, right? Like something is glittering off, light uh, being glittering off something beautiful, you know, just filling a room with these rainbow colors. I think it light and the interaction of light is the best, most consistent, and probably easiest way to describe majestic beauty. One of the things that, yes, I, I agree with you 100%. One of the things that uh, I um, really lean on is pacing when it comes to describing majesty. Um, when it comes to describing something that is big and beautiful and epically grandiose, is I will slow right down and I will lean in with the different tone that I would for horror, but it's essentially the same method that I'm using to drag this out. I want you to understand how tall this is, the the sheer immense weight of the presence of this inside the room. Because I, I can describe um, NPCs that are like the king, the mayor, whatever, as you walk, the beautiful maiden walks in the room. The moment you slow down, and you really paint that picture, people will suddenly get drawn into that. Um, so when it comes to um, something that I really want to awe them with, that's uh, special and phenomenal, uh, A, I like to put it in a very mundane setting. The princess is all well and good being the most beautiful maiden in the land in the throne room, but it's even more impressive in the tavern when she walks in, right? So... Um, no, and the, fish out of water kind of thing yeah and then i slow down to describe her and then everybody else is in you know grays and browns and that's it like i hit them very very uh generally everything around them gets zoomed out but they specifically get zoomed in whether it's a castle or a shrine or a god or an item right um 
Jeff, do you have uh, one tip for new DMs about visceral discomfort? I think a lot of this is going to go back to a lot of what we talked about earlier about the warning senses and how you can manipulate those things. Um, the feeling of nausea, the smell of rotting flesh or whatever the thing may be in your scene, the feeling of your skin crawling, um, that sense of vertigo that may come across a person. Um, all of this, these more subtle senses that aren't just right in the front, these are things you can use and manipulate to really kind of hammer through a visceral discomfort. Um, think about what, how you feel when you are uncomfortable with a situation and think about what kinds of things you can describe that might get the same response out of the people at your table for their character. Yeah, that's a good point. Kyle, do you have anything? I mean, I think Jeff, it nailed pretty much all the high points of it. Uh, warning senses is probably the best way to go. Um, you know, just those settled feelings of something being wrong, you can't like latch onto it, but you just know, right? So yeah, yeah I mean, I honestly, I just, I think Jeff said it really well. One of the things that I lean on when it comes to making my players uncomfortable at the table, and again, have a session zero before you do this shit. You don't want to make the players so uncomfortable that they don't want to play anymore. Um, uh, but one of the things that I lean on is I often look up what uh, like lists of phobias uh, ahead of time because there's arachnophobia fear of spiders sure that is really going to bother some people but it kind of bothers everybody at some level like nobody wants a spider on them right there's uh the i don't know i've met some people <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah there are some people that find it <laughs> but whether or not it's spiders or snakes or open spaces or tight and closed spaces suddenly you put the characters prone and crawling they're gonna feel a little bit more uncomfortable there's the idea of uh, slimy and wet. And every time that you start to think about these different phobias out there, now a phobia is an irrational fear of, but every one of them also has a rational fear of that the average person has that you can then turn around and, and lean on these, um, these gut responses to. And it's the difference between dread and horror and the overwhelming uh, depression of the gothic horror of Curse of Strahd, when I put you into the, the realm of ooze, it's suddenly a whole lot creepier. You do not get to be dry, ever. It's everything sticky. Everything <laughs> sticky. Right. I, I, want, I want you to understand that it's, it's sticky, but it's not lubricating. Like, it is sticky. Like, like you're chafing Viscous. in your in your armpits and your your crotch every step you take like it you can it's, feel it squishing between your toes yeah mm. right and so this kind of um this kind of setting that i'm leaning into that is a like a legitimate phobia of of things that are too slimy and too sticky i can't touch it i myself cannot touch styrofoam it freaks me out i do not like the texture of styrofoam i'm the uh, same with cotton balls popsicles popsicles and mop well, yeah like everybody's got a no, thing cotton balls like loose cotton balls like deal with q-tips but it's the loose cotton and it's like the feeling of them pulling apart it makes yep. my skin crawl i can understand that yeah i uh i the the thing that makes my stomach turn is the idea of chewing on styrofoam it makes me want to vomit uh, i i cannot be in the same room as someone with a popsicle <laughs> i have to leave the room could oh, you over a zoom call watch me eat one slowly no well, we're going to have an issue here in a minute then, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I'm, I wonder all, uh, suddenly what you define as a popsicle, and I worry for you. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I guess my thing is think about what makes people's uh, skin crawl when it comes to bigger phobias, and then bring that down uh, and focus on those little details. Like I say, um, claustrophobia is a real thing for a lot of people. Just being able to, like when you're crawling through, and you can feel the ceiling of the tunnel scraping across your back as you are crawling along. That's going to make some people, it's not going to totally make their skin crawl, but it's going to put them um, ill at ease. And this is something to think about when it comes to these uh, visceral discomforts that we have. It doesn't necessarily have to be wet, moist body horror. And a I lot have, of times it is. I have had a player who with that, like, this is when I was just starting to DM and I wasn't nearly as experienced at it as I am now, 
but if if I spent more than one or two sessions with my players underground, he would get visibly uncomfortable and agitated and would start being disruptive. And I don't necessarily know that he knew he was doing it, but it bothered him for his made up character to be underground for long. And it didn't even require me to try to drill down. It's something I noticed through happenstance, like, oh, I should probably get them out of here soon if I don't want to lose him as a player. Yeah. Suddenly this game just became open fields and dragons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not asking him to play in an underdark campaign ever. Look, and that's that's fair. Sometimes this hits people and sometimes uh, my favorite one that happened was I had a, a player who was um, playing a fire genasi. And uh, the player decided that they were going to have a general fear of water. Now, this was a little evil three shot that we played where all the characters were evil and they were out for themselves and they knew they were going to fight to the death at the end. Um, uh, however, he gave himself this. And over those three weeks that we played, he became less and less comfortable around bodies of water in his own life. Um, and he was telling me about, you know, I was supposed to go out on, a, a, I was supposed to take the sea bus in Vancouver. And he's like, I couldn't do it. I just spent an extra hour on the bus because I was so in my character's head for so long about, about drowning. They're like, I looked into the horrors of like crossing rivers and currents and shit. And he's like, it just really bothers me now. Um, <laughs> and like he, his character talked him into having an issue for a couple of months. He, he shook it off eventually. Um, but it it stuck with them because the other players figured it out, so they drowned the character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, evil campaign, right? Oopsie who better poopsies. who better to push your buttons than your own friends? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> if us describing how to work with all of these different senses and descriptive words has put you in a state of visceral discomfort, you can communicate that to us. At, on Instagram at It's a Mimic or on the Facebook page. Also at r slash It's a Mimic on Reddit. You can tell us all about how uncomfortable we've made you for whatever reason you are uncomfortable. Uh, the email address to contact us as well is info at It's a Mimic uh, Please bring your mailbag questions. There's always room for more and mailbag questions can be left at any of those sources at Instagram facebook the pinned post on our slash it's a mimic on reddit or to the email address um we love positive reviews if you're a fan and you've come with us this far and you haven't left a review somewhere please do it helps us find new people uh, share us on social media and spread the word tell your friends tell your enemies tell anybody you think might listen to us for more than 10 minutes and then on disgust just turn it off and delete <laughs> So the last thing that I want to jump into on this episode, and uh, we've spoken about this kind of in the past, uh, we dedicated an episode early on, and Dan Terry and I hit this way back at the beginning of the podcast, um, but uh, it's worth bringing up again now, almost 200 episodes later, um, that's the meta manipulations of setting the scene here. Um, so what I mean by that is what tips and tricks can a DM use to manipulate the players specifically. Um, we've been talking about things that affect the characters, but now let's talk about things that affect the players. And I have to say, session zero is the most important. Now, if you want to hear more about session zero, go back and listen to, I want to say it was episode nine, where we really dug into this um, at length. But session zero is incredibly important for people to feel safe and for there to be open communication about what is okay and not okay in a campaign. So before dice are even picked up, having a little meeting ahead of time, just to get everybody on the same page is very, very important. But once you have that list, and you now as a DM have a social contract that says that to a degree, you are allowed to be a sociopath and manipulate your players. When you know that they have a mild fear, Megan hates spiders. You better believe that I have a spider show up about every seven <laughs> sessions, right? Uh, she never takes them completely off the table because she has that, the same reason that we all go to horror movies, she has that weird love of, okay, that makes the skin crawls gross. <laughs> cool, right? Like, and it's that, uh, but I watch her shudder and shiver at the table whenever I drop spider minis on the map. So um, the things to really focus on and like I said, we've spoken about this across the entire podcast, are things like the specific wording that you use 
Um, the idea of using the right word at the right time instead of I was <laughs> I was bitching to Mieka the other day about how people are using a lot of made up words um, right now. Like uh, we're putting re in front of things that don't need it. When we say, hey, uh, I went to the mall again, the younger generation is saying I re-went to the mall and it drives me up the fucking wall that, that people do this. Um, when there's specifically a right word for this, you didn't just run quickly, you sprinted. Using the correct word can actually give far more description and hit these, um, these actions and um, these adjectives and adverbs. The way that we're describing our nouns and verbs uh, it gives way more impact to get rid of adjectives and adverbs at everywhere you can and focus on the correct noun and the correct verb right? It's a whole lot different to say, yeah, I was hit by a car than I was hit by a 1973 Plymouth. Like when you are specific, it paints a specific picture. And right? you, and you can slant the impression that someone gets by choosing a different word in that scenario, even going back to the sprinting example versus running quickly. If I tell you that an ogre is running at you quickly, is sprinting at you, or is charging at you, those are three completely different mental pictures yes. that you get from those three different ways to describe that action. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I like to use at my table, it really doesn't work so well online, um, although it can to a point, um, is using body language. When you're right. doing it online, uh, you have to rely on um, your facial features for the most part, and you're relying on people looking at the screen, not staring at their phone or drinking a cup of coffee or looking at the character sheet, right? So it's harder to do, but body language at a table is so important. When I lean back and look calm while I'm giving a description, they are calm. When I lean forward, when I look back, when I lean back in the chair and I say, yeah, it seems fine. Everyone, everyone says, oh, okay, it's fine. That's good. They're relaxed. If I lean forward and make eye contact and say, it seems fine, suddenly that's a whole different connotation just based on my body language alone. And now everyone's on edge and trying to come up with reasons to make extra perception rolls, right? So uh, body language as a DM, your breathing, your facial expression, and the level of tension in your shoulders whether you are leaning forward or back, uh, whether or not your hands are moving because you're excited or you're agitated, uh, whatever it is, that sets the tone. My favorite thing to do when my players are rolling death saves is I stand up at the table. They all freak out. They roll death saves all of the time because I'm that kind of DM. But when I stand up, that means, oh, they're fucked. And <laughs> it's a great thing to use against them. Uh, another thing that I like to use is pacing. I like to pace. I also like to give regular breaks so that I don't have to pause the middle of a combat so somebody can go to the bathroom, right? I will often in the span of a four hour session, about every 40 minutes, say this is a good opportunity to get drinks, bust out chips, go to the bathroom, you know, so get your refills um, because I want to control the pacing and I want to control as the DM, I want to control the attention of the players at the table. Uh, and like we were talking about with horror and with majesty, slowing down really drags them in. Um, so pacing is a major factor uh, in how I approach um, DMing with my players. Volume control is another thing. Um, I tend not to yell or scream. I've got a, a player at my table that's a little, I don't want to say jumpy, but gets put on edge when there's a loud male voice screaming. It's a session zero thing that we went into. Um, but I will definitely soften my, my voice and get quieter when I've got to whisper important information to people. When I've got an NPC drop their voice and get really low and start to whisper, people will pay attention. It really drags them in for a short period of time. That's like customer service trick with angry customers. Step number one, don't get loud when they get loud. Get quiet and make them come down to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one is repetition. Uh, I love to use repetition to drive the point home. I have to do this specifically with Dan because he has a real problem when it comes to um, character names, NPC names. He has played D&D so long that he has heard every single uh, combination of syllables in the English language get mashed together to make different names. You would think 
that Dan of all people, that that might have improved his pronunciation of words. No, it just, it turns into background noise over and over and over again. So one of the things that I have to do, Love you, Dan. <laughs> I don't, you're a piece of shit. So um, one of the things that I have to do regularly is repeat the characters' names over and over and over again. They ran into an NPC in Barovia named Casimir. My God, they could not get that name right. It took them an entire seven, uh, six hour session to get that fucking name right. And the next week they were getting it wrong again. Like it drove me up the damn wall. So there are um, specifically with names, but also when I want to have big clues to the puzzle that I want them to focus on, I will use the specific words over and over and over again, or I will have different NPCs mention the same location on the map because this will trigger their memories better. Uh, Kyle, you see me do this all the time in Call of Cthulhu. When you guys, um, I think just recently, you got the same pieces of information like three freaking times about where some of the statue pieces are. Yeah. And it's so that you guys know when the train gets here, get off the damn train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, if I only mention it once in passing and someone's notes are not complete, we could miss an entire aspect of the campaign. So um, this is something that I tend to rely on a lot. A lot of people like to use music. Jeff and Kyle, do you like that? I do in online play. I want to use it in in-person play, but I struggle to remember it. And when I try to juggle that in addition to all the stuff on the table in front of me, it gets left by the wayside. I use it all the time in online play as a substitute for some of the things that are harder to portray online, such as body language and volume that I can't get as specific with. So I'll try to substitute soundscapes that suit what I can't easily get somewhere else when I can't look someone in the eye or lean over the table at them. No, fair enough. Uh, Kyle, do you like music when you play? Uh, I like it. Do I use it? No, because it's just uh, too often too much to keep track of and I'll forget. Like it's just too much of a background for me. <laughs> I don't have the time or effort to go through fucking music, musical soundscapes. Um, we actually have a notoriously uh, uh, ridiculous one that happened on the podcast itself. Do you guys remember the mob episodes? Everyone was sending in clips um, for a while there. We had one that was a tavern sound. Um, we listened to the beginning of the audio clip and the end of the audio clip. We didn't <laughs> listen to the middle of it, and it was playing Christmas music in the middle of it. And we had no idea. We just thought it was tavern noises. So we plugged it in because we've already put like 12 episodes or 12 hours in editing this damned episode. So we just plunked it in. And I forget, was it you, Jeff? Was someone said, guys, why is this Christmas? I don't think that would have been me. I probably wouldn't have noticed that. But it was it was hilarious at the time. So we had to find different tavern music to set in the background. Um, I find music to be distracting. I'm not going to listen to it all of the time. So if there's a crescendo or a sudden uh, shift in tone in the music, I wanted creepy cave dwelling and suddenly it's tribal drums. I didn't sign up for that. Now I have to pause my narrative. So I've got to change the music. Uh, it doesn't work for me. So I, I very carefully vet the sounds that I use and build playlists for different places in my campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, my roll 20 music library for my curse of Strad campaign has like 20 folders dividing musical tracks according to where they are so that I don't do that to myself. Um, and the only real exception that I make to that is there's one, one, I don't remember what it's called. There's one very specific royalty free, um, like action combat track that it gets used on basically every live stream D, D campaign ever that has this one sound in the middle of it that breaks everybody's um, ten attention, attention span, suspension of disbelief. But I leave it in because it makes me laugh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because all of us know exactly when the sound is coming and it just makes me giggle. Other, but otherwise, I'm very careful in making sure that the music I play doesn't distract and adds to the tone and doesn't have anything in it that will pull you out of a scene. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why it takes us so long to do the Call of Cthulhu episodes, why there are months between them, is because we are vetting the music to the point where we just have our own music. Tyler yeah. does all of our music now. 
which means he needs time to write it. Um, he's actually faster writing than I am editing, but I got to edit it, then get it to him, then he gives me the clip, and I ask for something different. We go back and forth because I'm anal about the music. Um, it's, a, it's a different kind of baseline. So um, there's lighting as well. Again, I think this is hard to do with online. It's not impossible, but um, I do like to play with lighting sometimes. Once uh, we did our last Curse of Strahd, uh session years ago by candlelight and it was a lot of fun and very atmospheric that's not always an option but it is something that some people like to play with i've also known dm to shine a flashlight under their face like that's it's a little old school that was 3.5 we turn all the lights down and you, you do that to have creepy or evil moments or whatnot um, do you guys ever think about playing with lighting? Um, flipping the coin back a little bit to online play, virtual tabletops. I don't yeah. have experience with any of them but Roll20. But I do make use of the dynamic lighting abilities with the token vision properties, with dropping lights at certain places at the map. And not so much manipulating the room lighting when you're playing around a table, but what your, to what your player's tokens can and cannot see on a map. Um, so slightly different interpretation of what you're thinking, but I make use of every lighting tool that a virtual tabletop will give me. Yeah, when just to follow that thread a little bit, I physically make my maps. I hand draw them, right? And I use right. one inch by uh, so one inch squares, essentially on huge graph paper. Um, the back of it, wrapping paper. Yeah. So um, I uh, I end up thinking about their line of sight a lot. Anytime that there's a corner they've got to go around or they open a door or whatnot. I actually cut the pieces out of the map so that it slowly unfolds as they go, trying to simulate what the virtual tabletops do. Um, it is a long and arduous process, but something I think about as well. Um, but no, when it comes to like in-room lighting, I like to keep it as visible as possible. I'm toying with the idea of changing it a little bit um, and going to some of the darker, creepier. When you go underground, I turn the lights down, right? I'm really toying with that idea for uh, our Call of Cthulhu campaign, uh, Kyle, just to, just to try to amp up the tension a little bit, because that is a table full of clowns and assholes. <laughs> no, really, that table is, is me and Kyle, Dave and Terry, um, Jed, the guy who played Jed in the Eberron campaign, and James. Like It is just clowns and assholes, as far as the eye can see. Uh, Kyle, do you ever play with lighting at all? Uh, I don't. Um... But I would like to eventually, but I think I would use it very situationally. Like yeah. not everything needs to be lighted or mooted, but you know, when you're really trying to get across the import of what's going on, it can really uh, take your scene setting up to the next level. Yeah, but I agree. Just, yeah, yeah like, you don't want to have it too dark so people can't read their character sheets and the books. But you also, it also does add a little nice, ah, you know, yeah, chef's kiss to it. Um, people like to use visual aids too, whether or not it's uh, NPC art or um, uh, maps or props. Do you guys rely on these at all? Like, do you guys deal with handouts at all? Not much. I'll occasionally, again, because right now I play almost exclusively, well, pretty exclusively online for now. Um, I will occasionally put a picture of something that I've found as a handout on Roll20 and throw it up there, but I don't do it that often. I try more to rely on describing something than saying, here, look at this. Yeah. If, if, if only for the challenge. Yeah. Kyle, do you rely on visual aids? Uh, not a whole lot, but I think it does help the players sometimes visualize stuff and just keep a more solid picture in their mind. Cause I mean, players are sometimes just assholes. Like I play in another campaign where half our party doesn't actually know the names, the real names of any of the NPCs. It's all just, they heard a bunch of sounds together and then they reconstituted them in a new way. Like there's one character that they've just decided to nickname Al Jazeera uh, because it like the <laughs> consonants kind of line up and so like now i can't even remember the real name because it's just <laughs> al jazeera every time <laughs> so yeah having having a, a portrait or see this is the other thing too is anytime that i give a name and i see someone's making notes i spell it for them and then i say it again a couple of times this is that repetition that i use just to get through people's heads this is why i like it when i have dave or kyle at a table because they take notes 
Um, Dan's notes are notoriously ambitious and uh, equally as dense to try to read um, and often incorrect. Uh, the visual aids, I used to hand out props. I've stopped doing that. All it does is give 30 seconds of excitement and then shit to fiddle with at the table, right? Um, when it comes to maps, I prefer to do overland maps as opposed to battle maps. I will in the moment draw it, describe it, and be like, this blob over here is a, st is a tall tree that is this tall and it's this kind of tree and the leaves are doing this. And like, I will use almost metaphorical representation um, uh, for a battle map and it's put more time into an overland map so that people can, they'll spend more time looking at that anyway. Um, but when it comes to NPC portraits and stuff, I do put a little time and effort into it. I've noticed that with uh, Mieka doing the one-on-one -on -one Curse of Strahd campaign, that helps her connect to the NPCs because she doesn't get to sit back when you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, when there are only a couple of people in the party, you don't get the full experience of watching other players interact with the world or the NPCs and then glean more information by watching others interact. So I tend to give more um, of these meta manipulations to be uh, more engaging. I have a lot more homework to do when it comes to description um, because you make up your mind about whether or not you like the NPC. You don't have the luxury of watching another player then interact and have your mind changed. Right. Um, and the other thing that I do every once in a while, I don't do this often, but I like to interrupt. Um, and what I mean by that is, so the DM's dream is when the players are so engaged that they just start role-playing themselves. You can sit back and go to the bathroom and they come back and they're still having the same conversation. You're not like you are a bystander now at the D and D table. Cause they're so engaged every once in a while, I will interrupt with an NPC or rocks fall suddenly and uh, everyone dies. Yeah. Right. And so it's, it's that kind of the world is still moving on around you. Be aware of, of this. You never get a short rest behind enemy lines without there being a fucking issue. There's always something. Oh, we're going to bar the door. Great. Cause someone's going to try to get in right? That is just how I run it. So I'm consistently trying to use interruptions so that they don't feel safe. And these interruptions get really fast, uh, hard language about, um, I'm not going to paint the picture of the orc that busts that door down to murder you during a short rest. He's just a big, mean, nasty looking son of a bitch with a scary looking battle axe. That is when I just like hit that hard and fast because I'm trying to affect the pacing and the attitude of the players around the table. Now, there are some general narrative rules that people uh, apply to um, narrative writing that we don't always think about in D&D, &D, um, but it's something to really keep an eye on from a meta perspective. One of them is the rule of threes. When you're doing either horror or comedy, the rule of three applies where you have two fake outs and then you hit them with either the punchline or the scare. That's why think of the stereotypical blonde joke, right? When you, you present the information and then the brunette says this, the redhead says this, when the blonde speaks, it's the punchline. A priest, a rabbi, and a politician walk into a bar. It's always rules of three. So that's comedy. It also applies to horror. You'll notice this, especially in 80s and 90s horror, where the cat will jump out from the shadows and they'll get all tense for a minute and then nothing will happen. They'll peek around the corner and go, ah, and nothing will happen. And then the jump scare comes from behind, right? Like it's always rules of three. Another thing that people uh, focus on is the idea of thematic consistency. You brought this up earlier, Jeff, with people trying to be comedic and injecting comedy to break up the tension. But if you are thematically consistent with it, even if they try to be funny, but the train's still rolling anyway, that can really bring people into this as by having this uh, thematically consistent language that you're always using. Um, and the last thing that I like to think about, and this is almost specifically when it comes to items and NPCs, is the idea of Chekhov's gun, which is an old theatrical script writing term. But it means that if you show in a play in the first act a gun, that gun has to go off later in the play. Otherwise, it feels unresolved. If you drop, if you name drop the Amber Temple 
40 times before they they decide to go there and they decide never to go to the amber temple that feels wasted and unresolved if you make a point of saying there's the the six dwarves lined up one of them is looking at you uh super angry while the others seem relatively relaxed but then that angry one just turns around and walks out that feels unresolved if you're going to spend the time on description there has to be a payoff to it right do you guys ever think about these sort of narrative ideas um, or anything else when it, uh, like writing techniques and stuff when it comes to DMing? Let's grab dice and, and roll for this. Two. Kyle and I both get one, so Jeff goes first. Um, no, I got a six. Fuck. I got an 18. <laughs> All right, Kyle, do you ever think about these kind of uh, literary or narrative rules when it comes to DMing? I mean, the rule of threes is a very handy one. Um, especially when it comes to comedy it's i don't know what it is about it it just manages to help it land harder um in terms of using it for horror i think it could be good if you're going for a group or a solo description but it doesn't lend itself well to splitting it up right so if you're going describing one piece of horror for one character and then going to a different piece of horror for another character and then going to another one for a third character, it doesn't have the same kind of punch. Yeah, it, um, it's it's about the the audience, and in this case, the players and characters um, experiencing it three times. So what you're saying yeah, is yeah. absolutely dead on. Yeah, and then for Chekhov's gun, no, I don't think it translates itself to this medium of storytelling. Like it's just you are giving the players a lot of information and then allowing them to do what they want with it right uh Chekhov's gun is only useful if it's railroaded like if it's got a very concrete beginning middle and end yeah I tend to focus on Chekhov's gun when I hand out magic items um I have two two trains of thought when it comes to magic items uh one is give them a bunch of low-powered bullshit and see how creative they can be and the other one is if you give them something powerful expect it will be used um i gave my rogue a, a garrote at level two the garrote is made from the uh tail the hairs of the tail of a unicorn and it gets an auto kill if you can grapple an enemy with it but every time you do it one of the hairs breaks and there are only three hairs so there are only three uses of this mm. Now, for a rogue that's particularly murder hobo -y, that's a great weapon to use. But my God, you had better believe that I am going to give them enemies. If I don't want the enemy to die, they cannot get within range of that rogue. And they absolutely have to be larger. It has to be a giant or bigger so that they cannot wrap their arms around his throat. <laughs> right? Like that. Never that, mind giving them tons of opportunities that are really tempting to use it so they don't save it until the very final boss. Oh, absolutely. There's always <laughs> that one guy that's just a little bit too tough, right? So, um, so uh, like recently I had them fight uh, Baba La Saga and her hut. Uh, I made sure the rogue was fighting the hut because the garrote's not gonna work there, right? <laughs> so um, when I give the Chekhov's gun, I have to give them the opportunity to use it later. If they don't take it, that's fine. But if the if I don't then give the opportunity to use it, it's a wasted opportunity, right? And that's that's what I mean in this in this case. Um, you're right for the most part, uh, Kyle. But when I'm handing out magic items specifically, if I give you a potion of water breathing and then send you to the desert, that's a fucking waste. Yeah, uh, Jeff, how do you feel about these rule of three and thematic consistency and, and Chekhov's gun? I will be honest and say that I really don't think about them. Um, I don't come to DMing from a desire to be a storyteller so much as to be a facilitator of fun for my friends. I've read a lot in my life, but never as someone who has any thought for storytelling constructs or thinks too hard into how these things get done. So it's not something that I've put a lot of thought into because it's it's just not stuff that comes naturally to me. I have to, if I want to incorporate these things in my game, I need to do it actively or it's not going to happen. Um, Kyle, do you use pacing or volume of your voice to help paint a picture very often? Is that something you consciously lean on? Uh, I, I don't think I use volume to paint a picture. I use it more for role play. Um, pacing, I only really use it if I'm trying to get something important across. 
right? It's other than that, no, I wouldn't say I use it a whole lot. I say I I really rely on both of those to to get the point across to my players. Um, but I it took a long time for me to get comfortable kind of manipulating things like that. Um, using descriptive words is by far the best tool. These are um, definitely good tools to have in the toolbox. Um, and, and it's not something that I hit really, really hard, but it is something I've learned to, to hit subtly. Something to think about, if not necessarily implement in every scenario. Jeff, do you have any thoughts? Um, because I play on voice chat all the time. I try not to rely on volume much because I don't want to deafen my players or risk not being heard. What's one of the things I miss about in-person play is the ability to use such things um, using pacing all the time. All I speed up and slow down scenes, moments, combat descriptions all the time because it is something I can manipulate to either give a sense of urgency to whatever's going on or take that away. Um, to increase or decrease, like we've talked about with dread, with creepy vibes and stuff. Pacing is definitely something I focus on more than a lot of the other stuff we've discussed, because for whatever reason, it comes a little more naturally to me. Uh, pacing in combat, I've found personally to be a very important thing for me to focus on. I, I find it's very f common and frequent for DMs to struggle with combat feeling urgent to keep things moving, to keep the players on their toes and not sitting back in their chairs and thinking about things too much. So I work hard to use pacing to try to keep the tension that I'm going after. If I want a fight to be tense and urgent and scary and fast, I will go to lengths to make sure that I'm not introducing any device or any issues that are going to slow me down and remove the urgency that I want this to be, that I want to be present. Also, you tend to do a lot of horror as well, so pacing matters even more there. Even before, like the combat pacing thing, even before I've done, you know, touched Curse of Strahd, I've always focused hard on particularly combat pacing because it is so easy to let it get bogged down, to let it slow down and let your, get your players fragmented and out of the scene. And so I've always put a lot of effort into keeping combat pacing tight to keep my players invested and paying attention. See, that's, that's, something one, that's very easy to lose. That's one of the biggest challenges that I've found doing Call of Cthulhu as opposed to D&D. D&D, I have pacing down. It's easy. Call of Cthulhu, it's hard knowing when to zoom in and zoom out, uh, when to stop and give a description because everything is a clue, but also nothing is the right clue in Call of Cthulhu. Like, it's it's very difficult. So pacing has become something I've become very aware of uh, recently. Kyle, do you strategically repeat information over and over Oh, yeah, again? definitely. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, players are goldfish often. And sometimes you throw so much at them in a given day, it is helpful for both them and you uh, to keep it kind of fresh on both your minds. And like I, I for me, I want the players to succeed, so I like giving extra clues. You know? Yeah, I mean, it is our job as DMs to lose in the most creative and entertaining ways possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, so giving them extra hints and extra clues and stuff makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I repeat info all the time for the exact same reason, and it's not me helping the characters out; it's me helping the players out. Jeff, you uh, do you strategically repeat information? I do. There are definitely times that I don't, but for the most part, yeah. For the most part, I try not to be stingy with information I've already given them once. If they want it again, I'll give it again, even if it's multiple sessions later, um, because not everybody's an expert note taker. Not everybody has perfect recall and memory. But in certain situations, there may be times that I want to reward the person that the person that is observant, not the character, or the person who takes better notes by repeating something less just to see if they catch it so that if they catch it, it's a little bit extra player reward rather than character reward. So sometimes I'm stingy. It's with a purpose. Generally speaking, I am not greedy about information that I've already given them. Now, when it comes to descriptive adjectives and adverbs, like I was talking about before, using the right word at the right time, um, but also using just flowery language in general, um, we can often get bogged down in paragraphs 
uh, old older editions of D and D were really bad for this. You'd have to read a page of information at a time. Um, how much, or rather, I guess, what's your personal limit for when the description has gone on too long? When do you know I should wrap this shit up? They've got it, even though I've got a cool script or I want to do like. Do you power through anyway, or do you do you wrap it up, Kyle? What's your what's your gut reaction for knowing when your personal limit for descriptive language is uh, is too much? Oh, I mean, it, it's a tough thing. I a lot of the time I'll go on player engagement. Are, are they enjoying it, or do they not give a shit what the scene looks like? Um, will often tell me how far I gotta go. Sometimes I really, I spend a lot of time coming up with a certain scene, so they're going to sit through my description, whether they fucking want to or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but most of the time, it, I go based on player engagement. Uh, player engagement is the answer for me as well. Um, if they are tuning out, it doesn't matter if I'm giving them the right information. They are not getting it, right? So I will then have to come up with a way to get them that information at a later date. If they need that information right now, they are about to unlock the sarcophagus and they're not paying attention to the description of it and they need to hit the right buttons in the right order in order to, no, I'll describe it. I don't care if you guys are paying attention or not, I'll describe it. If you missed it, you will get hit by the trap. That's it. Yeah. Like that, And that's on you, right? But if I have the opportunity, like I'm going to describe the entrance to the dragon's lair they're going to need in four sessions from now, if they're not paying attention, I'll give up and I'll hit them with that info later when they capture a cobalt. Jeff, what's your personal limit? I think a lot of this in particular comes down to experience and not only experience as a DM, but experience with your players. Um, yes, it's player engagement, but knowing what engages the players at your table knowing what tends to be the average line for the average group. Some of these things, knowing where these thresholds lie comes from doing it and seeing when you, when what you do works or doesn't work, when what you say lands or doesn't. Um, and a lot of that comes from practice and from doing it and understanding through trial and error um, that I can go, I can go this far with description before I tend to lose people or in this situation, maybe I could have gone a little further. Um, also, slight deviation word choice in how you describe things what words you use uh not everybody has the same vocabulary and as much as i may like occasionally to use words that are the right word if it's the right word but four out of my five players don't know that word just by using that word i may pull them out of their immersion and break their focus so now they're wondering what the fuck does that word mean when i could be rolling along forward so choosing the right word sometimes isn't just choosing the word that describes something correctly, but also choosing words that will be understood quickly and clearly so that my players understand what's going on, exist within the scene and aren't pulled out of the scene by trying to figure out what the fuck the word you chose meant. Yeah, and it's also worth mentioning, there are some definite, definite cases I've run into about using the correct word, but it's a funny word um and that will that will pull focus as well so it's it's understanding but also keeping it within the correct tone as well uh for example if uh you get knocked unconscious you make your death saves but you're out the rest of the party isn't around because you split the party because you guys are idiots and uh, you wake up to a wolf chewing on the skin of your elbow i'm going to phrase it that way they are not chewing on your weenus <laughs> that is how you ruin the moment yes. yes another an, another example of choosing a weird word not that way but what, this what's wrong with my weenus well sometimes even just choosing the word that's written in a module if you're running a module that i know what that word is but again my, not all of my players necessarily do uh the room that my players were in there was an object in the room that was to be interacted with it is an object called a ewer yep like which if I had chosen the word pitcher, the scene would have gone a little more smoothly because I know what a ewer is. A couple of my players know what a ewer is, but a couple of them didn't. And they just kind of, luckily my players have been playing with me for a while. They're experienced enough to just roll with it. But we got to a point where I was asked to describe what the ewer was and then spell it. And luckily because I have a group that, that we all play really well together, they waited until the scene ended to bring this up 
but it could very easily have broken what was at that moment a very tense scene as one of the player's characters picks up the ewer and it changes something in the room and turns into combat. When if I had a different set of players, if I had just said pitcher, the whole entire situation could have been averted if you have players that will jump in the middle and stop you and say, hey, wait, what the fuck is a ewer? Yeah, and even, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, there's there are some famous ones in D&D too. Um, a, uh, a brazier is Yeah, not everyone one. knows what a brazier is. And I will freely admit for your own amusement that it took me until I was in my mid-teens because I read books, but I don't necessarily consume, I, audiobooks weren't a thing when I was a teenager really, except for like buying books on tape. Yeah. It took me a long time to know that Brazier was not pronounced Razier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, the first three times that I read it, I was reading it as Brazier, right? Hey. So, and look, and that brings us to, I think the last point um, for this episode as well is uh, know your pronunciation and don't be ashamed of it if you get it wrong. I rip on Dan a lot for mispronouncing things on the podcast. Um, but like I've said a couple of times, if a person's using the correct word, but they're pronouncing it incorrectly, it means they're reading and they're learning. And we should not shame them for that. Mm -hmm. This is a game of nerds and we need to support each other for this kind of uh, investigation that we're doing to make our craft better and more, uh, more whole. So uh, do you guys have any uh, final thoughts before we wrap this episode up? Do do know. good word choose make good description. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I nailed know. it, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, just go at your comfort level. Don't try to overburden yourself, especially if you're new. Um, just uh, stick your comfort zones first and work your way outwards. Right? Don't feel the need to try to take on too much all at once. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Absolutely. We spent two episodes now talking about the right and wrong ways to do things. And all of these are opinions. Everything works differently at different tables. Right. And one of the things that it took me a long time to figure out as a as a DM, one of the things I had to remind myself of when I started to uh, be the keeper of arcane secrets uh, for Call of Cthulhu recently is this is an evolution. It's an ongoing process. Do not try to be the best DM of all time uh, right off the bat. You're going to stress yourself out. You're going to miss stuff that actually is important. All right. It is more important that the players are having fun and getting and being engaged. And it is more important that you are consistent than it is to set necessarily tone or setting because they're there to throw dice and to eat chips and to make dick jokes with their friends. That is what D and D is ultimately about. By the way, there should be some cool moments in the middle. They should care. They should be engaged. And we have all sorts of tools to get them there. But honestly, go slowly and focus on one or two things at a time until it becomes second nature. And then you move on to another one. Nobody is nobody starts off being a dungeon master as a dungeon master. We all, we all start off as dungeon novices. And then dungeon apprentices, dungeon journeymen. <laughs> So that's all for this discussion on subtle descriptions. We've got a lot more tips and tricks for Dungeon Masters, so check back regularly to see what inspirations and insights we'll have for you in the future. Next week, we'll be exploring a classic dragon from previous editions that has been recently reimagined for 5th edition. Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website uh, at itsamimic.com, as well as a store for some subtly disturbing merch. Uh, we also rely on word of mouth to get news of the podcast out there to the community. So please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to another It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. This has been an It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, requests, and questions for our mailbags can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. Can you think of any specific circumstances in which, whether intentionally or not, something you've done as a DM or a player has completely flipped a scene on its head due to the way it was described and interacted with that's memorable to you? Yeah, let's roll initiative for this. I, I got a six. I got a 16. 11. Yeah, so I mean, we could take my most recent example where I... <laughs> 
murdered a village of bullywugs um, because I was under the impression uh, that it was a bunch of warriors and that there was 30 of them at my back between me and the rest of my party. So I did it. Like I dropped a fireball because I gathered them all together because I was planning on leading them to battle. Uh, and then I was like, no, shit, now they're going to kill me. So I dropped the fireball. And then afterwards, Dave is like, oh, you know, by the way, a lot of them were women and children, right? Like it could, it, that all could have been avoided when I said I cast fireball and Dave could have gone, just so you know, that is a bunch of children and women and unarmed people in that group. Would you right? still do that if you knew that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would have changed my action. Yeah, you would have definitely. upcast the fireball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, do you have anything that sticks out? Yeah, I have a recent memory from an unfortunately aborted homebrew campaign of mine that was like our session two that this happened. So I'm driving my players through a kobold warren through traps and deception and the, all the ridiculousness that kobolds can bring and slowly trying to build tension. And I built this whole thing so that if they went in guns blazing and tried to kill everything, that was possible. But understanding that there's several dozen kobolds in their level three, so trying very hard to hit that balance point right. They did nothing of the sort. They decided to do as Megan always advises and talked to their kobolds. So despite this, I managed to keep the tension all the way up to the point where they're meeting the leader of the kobold tribe. Uh, they walk into a room with what they think is a dragon that turns out to be a construct that the kobolds made out of assorted random bits of stolen shit. And we get all the way through this buildup to me through, through improvisation because they didn't do anything I expected, completely breaking the immersion and the tension as they suddenly are all speechless with the understanding that they the next thing they need to do is find out if these kobolds had legal permission to steal the things they stole with the government in the city that they're in and whether or not they, like, did this kobold tribe participate in bureaucracy <laughs> was such an absolutely absurd flip from everything they expected they were going to get, everything I expected they were going to get. It's not where I planned this going, but it's where we ended the session was, wait a minute. So now we have to go ask the city government if they signed a permission slip to take that stuff. That's hilarious. And I'm going to incorporate yeah. that into my cobalt shit in the future. It's <laughs> one of the funniest sessions I've ever had in D&D &D, and absolutely none of it was planned that way. That's what I mean by like, I don't intentionally plan comedic encounters, but sometimes they just happen that way. And I am absolutely happy to dogpile on the ideas of my players for good, bad or otherwise. And this just turned out to be a completely absurd scenario that none of us saw coming. So I have a thing that I made a mistake with the lack of description, uh, descriptive words um, and poorly setting up a scenario. This was a couple of years ago, and it was with Dan. Now, I do midweek content, which means that um, you can role play or explore anything um, in between sessions as long as you're at a calm point in the session itself, you have the opportunity to do it. So your character can, through chat or emails or sitting down over coffee, we can do these kind of uh, additional bits. Uh, we had ran an episode on midweek content uh, about a year ago. Um, but Dan and I sat down to do one where he was playing his dragonborn paladin, who was an elderly man and a paragon of good. Um, and he just wanted to get information from a city councilor and the city councilor, I think he was also a priest, um, had an item that he needed and was fleeing the scene. So he was deciding to go through this. But remember, the deal is no combat, no dice rolls. We use just your average um, passive stats and, uh, and we do it all through role play or just um, exploration. So he's chasing this character. And the idea for me was that this character is going to get into his office, get behind his desk, use a gnome, get behind his desk, and then open up a very small portal and disappear. Dan decided that what he was going to do uh, was cast a fireball or firebolt at this gnome. What I didn't bother to tell him is that this gnome is just an NPC. He's not a big, bad, evil guy. He has three hit points. <laughs> and, and his AC is... 10 
And Dan, we were playing at such a high level that Dan's modifier was above 10. So it's going to auto hit based on these freaking midweek conditions that, that we came up with. So he auto hit and murdered the gnome. So the portal closed. He managed to get the, the item and he got everything he wanted, but he was also a murderer and he was lawful good uh, and a paladin of Bahamut. And this changed not only his character's perspective on everything, where he then became a passive support character and refused to be the first one to draw blood in combat. If he rolled highest in initiative, he would not partake in this. We can talk this out, which frustrated the rest of the party. And he was like that for the rest of the campaign because he had inadvertently taken an innocent life. And then on top of that, he felt so bad about that, that he went and he became, because there was a gnomish blood plague. So this is one of the only gnomes left alive he felt so bad that he created a gnome character for the next campaign as penance because dan himself felt bad because i did not describe that hey this is a civilian not a combat mm. so that's a little background of the the uh conversation kyle that i had about you know that's really the dm's fault for fucking up this <laughs> description like, i've done this i i have fucked that up in the past <laughs> While we're stopped for a moment, when you were going over pheromones, it made me think of allelopathy, which is, if you're aware, is how some plants and fish actually fight with pheromones to be the biggest, best, strongest around. That's also how I fight with pheromones. Yep. Yeah. You just stink them out. Pretty much. Yeah. I will just, <laughs> I will just lift up my kilt and I will suddenly be the alpha in the room. Everyone will will run away just based on what they can smell. It's my, been my natural musk. It's been demonstrated with particularly territorial aquarium fish in groups that if you don't do enough water changes, you'll usually end up with one fish that's a lot bigger than all the rest. And it ends up being your dominant fish because their pheromones dominate the space. But if you do lots of large water changes, everybody grows at an equal rate and it knocks that competition back. Simply by doing more water changes and, and diluting the pheromones, it, re it removes that growth restriction on the subdominant fish. I'm going to do this with tritons. Anyway, just thought you'd find that interesting with your reptile nerdiness too. Oh, absolutely. But I also want to do that with tritons because that's like the triton shows up and is, you know, six foot two, because I think they're relatively large. Um, and, uh, and they just kind of reek. And if nobody ever deals with it, if nobody teaches them what soap is, they will just get larger and larger by the end of the campaign. They're eight foot four. Right. Like, and, and yet everyone else around them is somewhat stunted. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go through. To, sorry. I need to step away from my laptop for like 30 seconds. I may have put something in a trash bag and I need to intercept it before it goes. My roommate grabs it and runs into the dumpster. Sure. Give me one moment. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. It's drugs. It's definitely drugs. It's 100. Either that or his sex toy. Like, I'm done with you. I don't like you anymore. Yeah. And now <laughs> to do it. But shame after you're done, like. <laughs> the, that post nut clarity. And then, <laughs> but it's been too long. Things are getting muddied again. I need it back. Yeah. <laughs> I hope he can hear us. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Nothing. It's all good. We weren't slandering you. Thanks for listening. Bye.